This is Kristen O'Brien, and you're listening to the NFX Podcast. Today, we're talking with David Sachs and Pete Flint, founders who have each navigated two companies through two downturns and emerged stronger. David with PayPal and Yammer, and Pete with Last Minute and Trulia. Each of these companies went on to become market leaders, but not without hard-fought lessons. In this remote podcast, David and Pete share the specific tactics they learned about leading through hard times, the mindset founders need to adopt in order to survive, and what, as VCs, they're advising their portfolio companies to prepare for. David is now a co-founder and general partner at Craft Ventures, which, like NFX, invests in early-stage entrepreneurs. Let's jump in. So David, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm really excited to connect. You know, we've both been in um, somewhat similar kind of fortunate or unfortunate positions, building companies through recessions and, and ultimately the companies became more successful for it. So you founded Yammer in 2008, just in the kind of heat of the global financial crisis. And before that, PayPal during the dot-com crash. So a kind of wealth of experience there. And then my background in online travel in 2001 in Europe, and then running Trulia in 2008. Um, so there's a wealth of experience. So hopefully in this uh, podcast, we'll have a chance to really pull out some insights and give founders some thoughts about how to navigate the, the really challenging situation. So, so maybe just from your own perspective, during the your experiences in leading companies through a downturn, what are some of the things that uh, you felt you did right and perhaps some of the things that you felt you did differently during that time? Yeah, um, well, good, good to be with you, Pete. I think these types of downturns can be great times to, to build companies. Like you said, um, PayPal was mainly built right after the dot-com crash. The uh, The product launched at the end of 99, and three or four months later, we had the, the whole dot-com crash, and the, the company was mostly built in 2000, 2001, and then was the first company to IPO in 2002 and kind of ended the, the sort of the, the dot-com uh, bust. And then, like you mentioned, Yammer uh, began in 2008, 2009, and and we were in the midst of the, um, the Great Recession then. And so I think these can be, you know, obviously difficult and trying times, but also very good times to build a company. There's, you know, innovation doesn't stop just because there's an economic downturn. Um, there's always a need for, for innovation. And, you know, assuming you can get funding, which is, you know, the one thing that gets much harder during a downturn, everything else gets easier. There's fewer copycats, fewer competitors, uh, the war, you know, the war for talent and recruiting gets easier. So the so most things get easier. It's just fundraising gets harder. And talking about cash position. And, uh, you know, I, I shared a kind of post um, 28 moves just from my experience. And, and, you know, that certainly kind of a dose of realism plus understanding of cash position is paramount. I'm, I'm hearing, you know, I think every day the amount of cash companies need or the runway it seems to be extending, not um, not shortening. I guess, what are you thinking about and what are you advising your companies and, and what did you do when you're in this position? Yeah, I mean, what we're recommending to our portfolio companies is to have two years of runway. I mean, at least eight quarters and really 10 quarters would be better because when you think about it, uh, what's happening right now is everyone's business is, is getting disrupted. Well, I'd say 80% of startups are getting disrupted. Um, there's 10 or 20% that actually are seeing an increase in demand because, you know, we've got a, a one startup that's that's doing e-commerce, another one that um, is a nursing marketplace. And like both those companies are have seen a huge spike in demand post-COVID. But I would say that, you know, the other 80% of companies are going to be disrupted to some degree. It's, you know, a, a good number you know, anything touching, for example, the restaurant industry or travel or anything like that is, you know, the disruption is, you know, 80, 90, 100 percent. I mean, revenues has gone to zero. Then there's sort of the the ones that uh, are, 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 are disrupted, not because they're in an industry that's kind of gone to zero, but because um, d- deal cycles are taking longer. The, you know, there's there's less business confidence. Everyone's kind of cutting costs and taking a wait and see. And so we, we've kind of color coded our, our companies based on COVID impact. There's kind of red, yellow, or green. And, you know, red, red are the ones which have kind of revenues gone to zero. Green are the ones that have actually been accelerated. And, but I think most companies are probably yellow, which is to say that their pipelines have been disrupted, but they don't even know by how much yet. And so because of that, you know, you, 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 you're going to need probably two or three quarters just to adapt, make the changes you need. If you're in, you know, if you're kind of in the, in, in the red, you're going to need, you know, maybe a year to, to pivot and move to a, to a, a lower burn model. And then you're going to want to have another year after that to show that the new model is working. And so 
two years is really, you know, and then you need time to go run a fundraising process. So you really want to have two, two and a half years if you're a business that needs to retool or pivot or, you know, make major changes because of what's happened. Yeah, we, we've done exactly the same process and similar recommendation. I think just the reflecting on my own kind of experience the truly we raised in Q2 of 2008, a $15 million kind of in today's language would be series B. And we didn't get an up round for more than three, three years. And we essentially had to go public to get an up round. Yet we were kind of like growing at least doubling year over year for, during that period, if not more so. So I think there's also just this, not only is there kind of the fundraising window to open up, but also valuations coming down. So I think I think this is, it's certainly going to be a really challenging time. And for all the same reason, I think particularly on, on network affair businesses, if you can use this as a time to build market share, then you you are really, you know, sometimes last man standing. You know, many of these um, marketplaces that came out of 2001 or 2009 really were the last man standing. And they just built that network against a relatively uncompetitive environment and come out extremely strong. Is there anything just just as you think about what are the hardest things, the real challenges, and is there anything that comes to mind which uh, is super hard for founders to execute on that that you you feel is paramount for them to to do at this time? Yeah, I mean the hardest thing is always layoffs. Um, everybody hates doing it; they don't want to do it, and so they tend to to wait. Or if they do it, they don't they don't cut deep enough and then they have to go back and do it again. And so that, that's the, the, the one that, I mean, burn reduction is the hardest thing. And that's specifically the, the layoffs that are the biggest part of that typically. I would agree. And then, then the other component I think is communication. I, th- I think in this environment, your team is scared, you're, you're worried. And we'll talk about your, your hard talk post in a moment, but just the level of communication is, um, needs to be significantly increased. You know, if you're doing weekly all hands, maybe do them twice a week. If you're doing daily stand-ups, maybe twice a day, particularly in in this remote setting. And that and that will I think will really separate a number of leaders, not just companies from, from others. I, I yeah, I, I agree with that. You know, one of the, the points I make in, in the hard talk post is that, you know, when, when you, when you have to do the tough things, you, you have to, it has to be a company with a plan, you know, otherwise you'll just freak your team out. If you, if you, you know, make layoffs, but then don't communicate and keep communicating what the plan is moving forward to, to be successful then people will just be deeply anxious. And so, yeah, I think the communication is a huge part of it. I think, you know, maybe a third thing it, um, that's, that's hard for founders to do, but is really important at a time like this is, is to get all the legacy thinking out of their heads. You know, I think that there's so much that changes at a time like this. And in the, the, one of the biggest mistakes is to just be too anchored on the past and what the old plan was and the, you know, the old, uh, you know, what the old organization looked like and, you know, the old burn rate and the old um, roadmap and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and you really, and the, the big advantage a startup has is that it can adapt, it can pivot, it can change, it can throw away all those plans. But, it, but, it, but if founders don't kind of let go of that legacy thinking, then they won't be able to take advantage of that. Yeah. I, I, you know, there's, we obviously talk a lot about product market fit as investors and founders need to realize the market has fundamentally shifted for 80% of the companies. And that kind of means that your product and your company will have to fundamentally, may have to fundamentally shift it case by case. But this is where, this is where kind of stubbornness uh, is an, while is an asset for founders, adaptability is more important. Uh, in, in helping companies get through this. Yeah, I, I just had a conversation with a couple of founders the other day. And um, I mean, their their original plan has been completely disrupted um, uh, by COVID because they're, they're basically selling to college students and all the college students are home right now. So there's just no distribution. And they, you know, they were outlining uh, a plan for the business that involved a pivot. And the point I made to them is, look, you've still got $5 million in the bank. If you are a, a company graduating from YC, you would love to be in that position. You know, you've got a great team of engineers. You've got $5 million in the bank. Your original plan now has been totally disrupted, but you know, you can do anything you want. The, the new plan shouldn't just be a rationalization of the old plan it should actually be your the the absolute best plan the the thing that you would be most excited about going all in on and i think you know at a time like this founders should always be all in on their best idea 
And you, you just can't afford to be kind of, you know, hedged or pursuing a bunch of different things. You really need to figure out like, what is, what, what, what is our best idea? And just how do we focus on that? Mm-hmm. You know, I think, you know, if you're, if, if you've now, if you don't have product market fit, either because you never had it or because of the disruption that's happening now, don't be afraid to take your startup down to the studs effectively, because it's a lot easier to manage and adapt and find product market fit as a seed stage company. And, um, and, and that's one of the big mistakes that, you know, series A, series B companies make is they keep operating with all of this you know, series B type headcount and burn, even though they don't have it, they don't have series B product market fit anymore. In a lot of cases, it'd be better off going back to it being a seed stage company. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's a bunch of companies that have made those pivots successfully, but, but the majority of them don't, you know, this sort of persistence at adaptability companies that get through this, this period almost have a, um, you know, it's really about a narrative almost of, about persistence, kind of never giving up in the face of adversity. They're, they're founders that they may just throw in the towel if, if they kind of real, realize they've lost product market fit. In your experience coming across hundreds of thousands of founders over your career, you know, what do you think the psychology of that persistence is and what's driving, what, what's the sort of kernel of that persistence that separates founders that get through this as founders that don't? Um, you, you know, I think there's there's a, a greater sense of urgency on on the part of the founders who who make it. Um, for some reason, they're just more finely calibrated, almost sort of more high strung in a way, um, and more you know they're just they're able to react much quicker to the changing circumstances and and, and sort of throw away the old plan and, and figure out a new plan. And, um, you know, the ones who don't make it, there's just kind of this lack of urgency. There's always kind of like a wait and see, you know, I, I give an example. I've got a, I've got a company that, um, you know, we, we invest in the series a, the founder had three years of runway. He's been running it very frugally, you know, and he asked me, well, is three years of runway enough. I said, yeah, you're actually in pretty good shape compared to a lot of other people. And he still went back and got his team to all, including himself, take a 20% pay cut. And he figured out how to cut some costs. And now he's got four years of runway. I mean, that's just like a tremendous sense of, of urgency and sort of, you know, finely calibrated um, and reacting to the changing circumstances. And then I've got a lot of other founders who, you know, their, their reaction is, well, we're going to wait and see how things shake out over the next three months. And then if things look bad, we'll, we'll make we'll make cuts then. You know, I guess that can work too, but but it's just you know much less urgent somehow. And you know, there's always uh, a, a reason to kind of postpone the, um, the the tough things that need to be done. Well, of course, if that you know, I, yeah, I, I see the same thing. And of course, you the founder of the delay of basically burning cash during this time with very low revenues, and that shortens their runway. Right, and it also. If, it essentially makes it much harder for them to uh, motivate the team. If they've tried something and tried something and tried something, then I think it's just a sort of a slow death as opposed to being responsive and being fast. At a certain point when, you know, when all the companies around you are cutting costs, your employees will actually develop, you know, they, they've got some sense of what's happening. And, you know, if, if they know if the burn is too high. And at a certain point, if you just keep procrastinating it, they're all just kind of looking around at each other saying, when is, you know, when is the axe going to fall? And, um, you know, and it, and so in a weird way, you don't get rid of the anxiety by procrastinating. You're, you're better off acting, figuring out what the plan is going to be. Um, I mean, you don't want to just cut willy nilly. You do want to figure out what, what the sort of go for plan is. But, you know, you, you then make those changes as quickly as you can so that the people who are remaining with the company like feel safe and comfortable and they understand that, you know, we, we only needed to do this once and, um, and, and they, and they buy in, you know, to your point about communication, they buy into the, to the new plan. And, you know, the longer you sort of procrastinate doing all those things, the, the more anxious people actually become. When I was running truly the, you know, I'm, you probably remember that time the Dow dropped a thousand points. It's a chorus, another memo that was widely distributed. You know, I was, I was in that meeting, their offices and, um, ended up calling a staff meeting on or a, or a management team meeting on the Sunday afternoon. And we basically came in on Monday morning and, um, presented the plan, you know, talk about the market, talk about what's happening to the economy, talk about what's happening to the industry, and then talking about our specific plan and kind of what was, what were some of the changes in terms of people that we had to make. And then also just person, almost, um, person by person, how they fitted into our kind of, into our business model. 
in the sense that this is a explain the financial details saying team by team, if you can move this metric from here to here, then the compounding impact of these changes from everybody will lead the company to profitability. I think that, you know, being very explicit, over, almost overly explicit at this time is necessary to give people the transparency and kind of comfort that there's a very explicit plan. And then they can see their role in achieving that success. How do I contribute to this company's success? And that, uh, and knowing what everyone else is doing can be, I think is a, a very clear way to do that. I'm curious from your experience in uh, kind of Yara and Paper, any any experiences of specific tactics that you did or you had to navigate that that you might might be helpful for the audience? Yeah, um, I mean, so as I think back on PayPal, it, it sounds it sounds a lot like what what you went through at, at Trulia in the sense that we the PayPal business model could be expressed as a formula very easily. I mean, it was very you know, it was very straightforward. It was basically transaction volume times the price of transaction fees minus fraud minus funding costs minus customer support. And so everything could be kind of traced back to that. Um, and um, and so, you know, we showed everybody how they fit into that and where we need to, to move the numbers to. The, the PayPal story really was a story of, you know, a series of life and death struggles. Everyone, I mean, the PayPal mafia now has gone on to so many other things and, and PayPal's a $100 billion plus company, but people don't realize how close it came to, to dying multiple times. And um, at one point in, I think, mid-2000 or mid or late 2000, the company had about $40 million left in the bank and we were burning $10 million a month. And so, you know, it doesn't take, you know, a genius to figure out that you've only got about four months of, of runway and, you know, the, the company's about to run out of cash and die. The, the big lever that we pulled at that time was we, you know, PayPal was basically free and we had promised, uh, we had promised the customer base that that payments would be free and, and the the thinking was that payments would be a loss leader to get people into these financial accounts, basically bank accounts, and we would make ultimately make money by upselling various kinds of financial products. And what we realized is, and and you know, there was a, there was some amount of skepticism or, or disbelief that people would ever just pay for the basic payments product. But we ran out of time, and we realized that there is no plan B here. Uh, we just need to go with the product we have and charge for what we're already you know putting out into the market and you know we don't have time to to do some sort of upsell and so you know over a few week period we basically forced all the users to pay transaction fees you know we were very worried that this could lead to enormous churn we could lose to competitors but as it turns out people were willing to pay for the service and you know virtually overnight we were able to slash the burn by by turning on revenue and you know things got a little more comfortable after that it was still pretty pretty tough so i think you know this idea that raised prices that can be a major lever but you know this idea of you know th- there th- there is no plan b there is no time for kind of elaborate multi-step plans you've just got to be all in on whatever your best idea your best product is right now yeah, necessity is the mother of invention i've been speaking to founders that are that think oh, okay we'll raise money in next year or in sort of 12 months and i think there's that mental shift to say there is no money yes for, for some kind of more mature company. there is no kind of backstop there is no there is no alternative almost like that movie the martian where where, where he's got to figure it out right that there is nothing like that to focus the mind yes and figure out how you navigate this path and figure out how do you get profitable and of course that may not be po- possible from the kind of the earlier stage companies but the thought process is often illuminating and then you really drill in on like do i truly have a 10x product do i truly have product market fit is this something that if people will buy this when they're feeling poor and almost unemployed then then it's a pretty interesting product yes so I think we're about to find out how many products are actually mission critical because everyone's slashing their budgets and, um, you know, any product that's kind of optional, people just aren't going to pay for. And so over the next few months, I think a lot of companies are going to find out that, I mean, they're, they will have more churn or their deals will take longer to close. Um, and we'll find out they just aren't, aren't that mission critical. And, you know, VCs, I think are waiting for that data. And so it makes it kind of a really bad time to be going out and, and raising is, um, you know, I think VCs want to know which, which businesses have been disrupted and which ones haven't. And it's going to take a couple more months for us to, to see that in the numbers. But, but I, I agree with what you said about, you know, the, the money that you have in the bank for 80% of startups, that is it. I mean, you have to assume that that is all the money you're ever going to have. I think, you know, when times were frothy, 
there was this, you know, there's an assumption that every 12 to 18 months, you'll be able to raise an up round. And, uh, you know, there's always a, a bigger, better deal, you know, a, a year or 18 months in the future. And I think now the situation we're in, there's about 10 or 20% of companies that have been accelerated by this, but the other 80%, just the money you've got in the bank is all you're ever going to have. And so how do you, how do you make that last to give yourself enough time to find product market fit and to have enough time to, to have enough game tape after you find product market fit for the number to reflect that? Because it's not like you can just go out and raise, you know, a month after you supposedly find product market fit. You need to have three or four quarters of, you know, rapid growth after that moment to prove that, that you have it. And so, you know, startups really need to make sure they have the time to, to, to be able to do that. Um, I mean, I remember back in 2000, 2001, during the dot-com crash, um, you know, it went on for two years. It, you know, we had this sort of the, the stock market crash, but then, you know, the stock market just kept going down gradually after that. I think the, the, the initial crash was about a 50% down in the dot-com stocks, but then they went down another 90% over the next two years. It was like this gradual erosion. And, um, and, and the startups you know, just kind of one by one fell by the, you know, most of them did just fell, fell by the wayside and died. And you have to ask, well, why didn't they just make the cuts, you know, up front? They could have given themselves years of runway. And, you know, they were all just kind of constantly hope, holding out hope that things would just get better. And they weren't making serious enough cuts to give themselves the runway they needed to get to, to essentially reinvent themselves. Yes. And just to build on that, you you recently published an article about um, happy talk versus hard talk, the willingness to ask tough questions. And, you know, we talked earlier about kind of confronting this reality, the like really sort of digesting the the gravitas of what's going on. Like, can you just share a little bit about kind of the thesis and kind of what, what was the trigger point for that article and, you know, why perhaps many founders avoid hard talk? What are the intrinsic reasons that perhaps why for happy talk? I guess, I guess the trigger is, you know, so, so happy talk is it's, um, I think it's probably the number one killer of startups because, you know, and I, and I guess the, the, the trigger for the blog post was, um, I mean, I have these meetings with founders all the time where the meeting starts off and everything is wonderful and they tell you how great they're doing. And by the end of the meeting, you realize that actually there's only three months of runway left and they're about to run out of money. Why? You know, and I've just had so many of those meetings where I'm just like, there, there must be something, you know, that, that, that there's something, there, there's like a deeper psychology to this. And I think it's because founders have to be optimistic. You know, the odds are so stacked against you as a founder that you have to be optimistic to, to, to create a, a startup. And, and, you know, you, you encounter so much rejection, you know, in the early days of a startup, whether it's, you know, prospects telling you no, or employees who, you know, or would be employees who, who, who don't want to come work for you or, or, you know, investors who say no, there's just so much rejection that a, um, an entrepreneur, I think does have to be fundamentally wired for optimism. But if that wiring kind of locks them into this happy talk mode and they can't, and they kind of lose um, the ability to see ground truth, the, the reality of their situation. That's where it becomes a huge problem. And so I think the best entrepreneurs are able to maintain this dual state where they're very optimistic about the vision of the company and where it's going and, and that it will ultimately prevail. But they have tremendous clarity about the day-to-day challenges and what they need to do right now and, and the existential risks. And they work to systematically knock off those risks. Kind of like well, uh, Andy Grove paranoia. So optimism is great, but but paranoia is um is is just necessary during this time. And it's sure things might bounce back in six months' time, but what if they don't? Because the unemployment rate is through the roof, and um, we may be not social distancing, but the sort of downstream societal impacts are going to be um, way bigger. And and I think the, the sort of paranoia. Is, is absolutely a key asset in good times and, and bad times. Yeah, I, I, I think the whole, you know, only the paranoid survive philosophy, yeah, it, it very much dovetails with this. You know, what, what does it mean to be paranoid? I think what it means is that you are constantly seeking disconfirming evidence. So you've got a thesis, but you, you know, and you're, you, that you're optimistic about, but it doesn't cause you to have kind of confirmation bias. You go looking for the reasons why it, it might not work. You go looking for the big existential risk factors so that you can systematically eliminate them so you, that you can work the problem. And if you're just not sort of intellectually honest about the ways in which the startup isn't working, then you won't be able to solve those problems. I mean, the, the, the key is you have to 
I guess you have to be paranoid in order to find the problems and you have to admit the problems in order to be able to fix them. And the, the reason why happy talk is so pernicious is that if you can't, if you can't even admit to yourself or your board or whoever, like what the, or your team, what the problems are, you're definitely not going to be able to solve them. I, th- I think there's, um, from a paranoia perspective, there's, I mean, there's also just how to manage risk. I think you've, you've seen how, you know, I've had conversations with founders who are saying, um, I think we'd delay these cuts or the, these changes because it, they think it will help. They'll, they'll be in a position to raise money in the future. And I think you, you know, this is not just a, the outcome of a failure of mistake here is your company will go bankrupt. That's right. And I think there are very few examples of bankrupt companies in kind of in recent history. It's just because we've been on this kind of 11 year boom. But the bankruptcies are like, I think you, you remember the kind of blogs. I mean, the ticker of bankruptcies that went through in 2001 and in 2009 was just a daily occurrence yep. of companies. And were, layoffs is one thing, but bankruptcies were kind of um, were a daily occurrence. And I think that seems so far from the truth. And so just managing risk of sure, of, of course, you can sort of make some changes today. Uh, and if you don't, if you don't have precision on those, then the downside situation is not necessarily a down round. It is, it is bankruptcy. That's right. Um, which is, which is gonna, it's going to be a real, very real situation. And how, how, just from a, a, a communication perspective, you know, we, we've talked earlier how um, transparency with the team to get them to kind of have confidence in the plan and confidence of the team is, is critical. You know, that said, you know, transparency can be a double-edged sword. You know, my, my sense is today is that teams are looking for almost true transparency in what's going on into an organization. Uh, I'm curious to get your take in terms of the degree of transparency within an organization. How necessary is that from a, from a, from the average employee, not just to the board? I, I mean, I think it's, it's very important. You know, we dealt with this, um, I mean, a very different type of issue, but we dealt with this to some extent at Zenefit when we had to do a turnaround there. To some degree, the employees already know that there's a huge problem. And if you don't acknowledge it, um, or admit it, speak to it, then it just, again, makes everyone feel more anxious because they feel like it's not being addressed or it's being covered up or, you know, rather than cleaned up. So I think the, the transparency is, is very important. And the only thing I would just add to it is that when you, you, you do have to kind of give people, you know, I've called the hard talk kind of the opposite of happy talk. It's the, it's the um, I'd say, harsh assessment of where things currently stand. I think it's important to combine that with a plan moving forward, that gives people some hope. You know, I don't think you just want to lay all the negatives on people without also giving them a highly actionable plan to let them know that if they do those things, there is a path to success. Yeah, it's, you know, there's a lot of talk about wartime CEOs and we reference Churchill and and it's sort of, you know, giving almost every team a mission and an objective. And this is their mission to achieve. And if they succeed in that mission, then ultimately if other people see it in their mission, then the company be successful. And, you know, like any sort of any mission, you're going to have these unexpected surprises and unexpected challenges along the way. And, you know, you don't know necessarily, you don't have all the direction of what to do, but it's imperative that the teams go out and execute on those individual missions and innovate along the way. But that, that sort of clarity about what's asked of people, and I've seen 98% of the time that, People rise to the rise to the challenge. They kind of get excited by this. Uh, they can see the path. If there's if it's a realistic path, then, then the sort of energy and ferocity and innovation comes out, and it can be inspiring for many teams. They um, they go from deer in headlights through to commandos and and really figure out that this is the path to be to, to, to success. Yeah, I, I agree. That's that's uh, very well said. Yeah, I think. You know, to- you can focus people's energy on on missions on a concrete plan. Then they're they're gonna they're gonna wallow in the negatives and the anxieties if they don't have that. Um, but if they have a, a tangible plan to execute on, I think they will enjoy that. They prefer that. Um, and you know, if you're on the other side of whatever hard cut you make, then I think that's it's doubly true because they you know this is a team that you've decided to stick with, and um, it's very important to convey that that you know. Obviously, with any cuts that you have to make are very unfortunate, but the people who are remaining are the people who are the most important uh, moving forward to accomplish the mission. So to extend the, the kind of wartime CEO, you, you reference 
Churchill. I'm a, I'm a big Churchill fan as well. And, um, you know, he's obviously a great kind of leader and an orator as well. So a lot of his quotes and stories kind of resonate. You know, there's, there's many kind of quotes from Churchill at this time from, if you're going through hell, keep going, was is one of my favorites or the never let a good crisis go to waste or the empire of the future or the empires of your of the mind yeah you you referenced churchill in your article what what's what was the reference that well he um to, to me he's an exemplar of hard talk which is the opposite of happy talk and um you know when you read his speeches there's a type of uh, bracing clarity to them where he acknowledges what a dire situation they're in um, there's no kind of shirking away from that he talks about how the the british way of life is at stake not not just that but all of western civilization um you know he talks about how um you know if the nazis win it it would be you know it it would take civilization back to some dark age I think, uh, what does he say, perverted by the lights of a, dark by the lights of a perverted science or something like that. Um, anyway, there's a lot of like bracing language about um, the, the dire situation they're in. But at the same time, there's also a lot of um, inspiring, you know, l- language in there as well, that if they do, you know, face this this menace and, and when it will be, you know, the, people look back for a thousand years and say this is their finest hour. So he, he manages to find, uh, I think, a really uh, great combination of um, giving people the, the ground truth, but also inspiring them. Yeah, it's... Um... It's remarkable. Yeah, it's remarkable. There's a lot and some great movies as well. You know, given this kind of very strange setup where we're remote working, we're collaborating over Zoom and kind of online. I'm curious from your perspective, either sort of tips or or tactics that you're seeing from founders or teams, or also just how to manage tough conversations over this environment. It, It sort of feels that in some ways, the stress of the situation plus the sort of, frankly, the kind of impersonal nature of these these platforms almost makes it easier to have hard conversations um, that you sort of forget with perhaps the niceties and the kind of chit-chat and you get down to the kind of the really hard issues. What, what's what's your perspective on, given this strange working environment, you can't look someone in the eye and can't look someone physically in the eye and kind of have these straight conversations. How are you seeing founders navigating it, either in the board conversations or in their team conversations? Yeah, I mean, it's the the, um, the idea of doing layoffs via Zoom, or I'd say even the the post layoff conversations with the rest of the team get so much harder because you can't do it in person. Um, there, there's that's definitely true. I think that you know if if you are going to do layoffs, I think there needs to be a communication plan that's really well thought through, not just for the people who are being laid off, but also for everybody else afterwards. And um, like you talked about, the, the reasons for why this is happening and what it means and what the path is moving forward have to be over communicated to everybody. You know, whereas some of these things might have happened in a all hands meeting before to some degree. Now, you know, you may need to do an all hands via Zoom, but before that, you might want to just do more one on ones. Or if the CEO can't do them all, then the exec team needs to, you know, um, go through, a, you know, run down a list and maybe every member of the exec team, you know, every employee is talked to by somebody for 15 minutes, half an hour, whatever it is. So yeah, you really have to think through that. Yeah, I think that the human element of what's going on, I think with a sort of stress and panic that companies seeing, if they forget the human element, then um, it's very hard to recover from that. Just because, well, so much of the success of helping a company rise from a challenging period is the culture. And uh, it's particularly hard to manage and curate cultures right now. But if you're able to figure it out, or if you have a strong culture to begin with, then you're going to be in a much better situation. I was going to say, we have a couple of startups that um, were fully remote. And, you know, I was, I've was i always been a little bit skeptical of that because the companies I've been involved in you know, had a strong kind of central headquarters. But they, they're, they're managing quite well with this because they already had all the processes in place. To, to kind of keep hold their teams together. So um, for them, it's been easy. It's been no change. Um, and then everybody else, they've had to figure out how to do it. So maybe, so maybe let's switch to COVID-19. So I guess in Silicon Valley, like in the, in the technology ecosystem broadly, like what do you think um, we're doing right? And perhaps what do you think we're not doing enough of? Well, there's been a, a weird dynamic over the past month where I feel like tech Twitter has advocated for things and the, the so-called experts have been against them and then um, and then a week or two goes by and then all of a sudden you know the experts get on board with it yeah 
And so like mass is the latest example where, um, I mean, I don't feel like I'm an expert on anything, but I've been tweeting about the need for mass for, you know, over a week. And, um, it was just crazy to me that that wasn't part of like the standard kit of things that we were doing. And, um, and then finally the, you know, the experts just got on board with that. Um, there were other things, the use of um, blood serology tests as a way of doing, you know, at home finger prick testing. You know, we were tweeting about that weeks ago, and um, now the FDA has finally just gone on board with approving it. The expansion of the right to try and, and use things like hydroxychloroquine, don't know if it's going to work, but certainly makes sense to, to be trying these things. Um, so and all of these things have ultimately happened. It's just, um, it seems like the experts have always been a couple weeks behind. You know, I'm not sure exactly why that is, but um, I mean, I do feel like for us at, at Kraft, we... I feel fortunate that the people that I know a bunch of the people on Twitter who have been very early on this and because I know them, I sort of trust them. And when I saw them tweeting about what was coming, you know, we, we took it more seriously, I think. And so, you know, at Kraft, we started doing work from home on March 1st. It was about two weeks before the shelter in place. And, you know, that turned out to be a very important time for people to get ready and get whatever supplies they needed. And that happened because I was listening to Bology and, you know, other folks you know, who I know on Twitter. And so it feels to me like tech Twitter's done a decent job of being ahead of the curve on this thing. And, you know, I'm, I'm certainly grateful to all those people who are kind of the early warning system for this. Yeah, for sure. I think that's just, I mean, when you're, you know, Silicon Valley can be often described as a bubble. And in this context, the echo chamber was very noisy weeks ago. And I think, um, I mean, the good and the bad of Twitter, it sort of amplifies perspectives and uh, it's very true. And I think that's, you know, San Francisco and Mayor London Breed was ahead of the curve in many things. I'm not sure that how much that was influenced by um, the sort of tech sector. But, you know, I feel in today San Francisco is in a fortunate position. Silicon Valley is in a fortunate position relative to a number of other U.S. and international cities, for sure. It seems like the one place that took it seriously before it was directly hit hard. It seems like the pattern just about everywhere else in, in the U.S. and I'd say probably Western Europe as well is that people haven't really taken it seriously until their own social networks are impacted. You know, when it was in, in Wuhan, mostly we were seeing these videos um, of them. You know, people in hazmat suits, um, you know, doing these, the streets being empty and being disinfected, you know, by these white plumes of smoke. And there, and, you know, there was just very little coverage of it in the U.S. And, um, you know, people, it, it was just, it, it felt like something was just happening somewhere else in the world. And then it happened in Iran and then it happened in Italy. And there was still this sense, well, that's, you know, not going to happen here. And, you know, then it started happening in Washington state and, um, you know, even New York, it they were very, very late to, to react. And I was getting text messages from friends in New York, and there was just no awareness of it happening there. And they were kind of um, dismissive of the, you know, the, the crazy tech people on the West Coast who are paranoid about this. So it does feel like San Francisco was slightly ahead of the curve. And we, you know, again, we had these folks who were a little bit of an early warning system on Twitter. And it's been a great resource. I mean, the... Um, the strength of Twitter is is that is the ability to get decentralized information routing around these experts who don't seem to know what the hell they're talking about. I mean, if you go to the WHO website, the things they're saying on their website are just manifestly not true. You know, that you don't need a mask unless you're taking care of someone who's infected with COVID-19, that, you know, that maintaining a three foot distance from someone who's coughing and sneezing um, is sufficient. I mean, things like that is crazy. You know, the best part of Twitter is being able to get access to decentralized information. I mean, the worst part is kind of the tweet mobs that you also get. But there is something very positive about it right now. From your perspective, what do you see as is, is some of the longer term impacts on society and Silicon Valley? What do you, you know, as, with an investor hat on, what do you see as some of the opportunities? Well, it's it's very hard to know the future. I, I sort of see it as scenarios. And then you kind of assign a probability of scenarios. And I think right now there's kind of three scenarios. There's the V, the U, and the L, <laughs> which, uh, you know, kind of generally apply. To- in terms of recovery. Yeah, in terms of recovery. the shape of the recovery. But I think you can also use that as a proxy for societal impact and, and geopolitics and a bunch of other things. I mean, if the U.S. doesn't have a V or u shape recovery and it gets into an L, then the ramifications are going to be huge. And, um you know, we don't we don't even fully know what all of them are going to be. So, you know, I tend to think those are the scenarios. And then I, I've got friends all across the spectrum. I've got some who are very optimistic and think it's going to be like a V, and uh, that we'll get you know that that will 
arrest the, you know, in, in, in April, it's going to be tough because of the lockdown, but that will arrest the exponentiality of the virus. And then, you know, starting in this summer, maybe June or May, we can start getting much more fine tuned in our policy. And we let people out of lockdown based on risk factors. And we have, you know, we, you know, have gloves and masks and, and ways of managing that, that are, aren't as bad as lockdown. And that by the summer, you'll have, you know, treatments and, you know, towards the end of the year, you'll have a vaccine. And so they're, they're kind of on the optimistic side of this. Um, and that would be kind of the V. And then there's the U, which would say that basically the V story is largely correct, but the, the wound we've, you know, in the sense that, yeah, we'll get treatments this summer and we're going to figure out an alternative to full lockdown and eventually we'll get, you know, we'll get a vaccine in a year. And, but they would say that that narrative is largely right, but it's the wound we've suffered is more grievous than that. It's going to take longer. It's not going to be perfect. It's going to take a few more months. Um, and we're probably likely to have, you know, 18 month, two year to something like recession. And then you've kind of got the, 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 the case that's worse than that, which is, um, that actually, you know, that we've never had a running stop of an economy like this. And, um, you know, I was watching an interview with Kevin Warsh, former Fed governor the other day, and the way he put it was, it may be possible to bring the economy to a sudden stop, but it's unclear that we're going to be able to, to, to do a sudden restart of it. And right now it does feel like the economy is sort of unraveling. And, you know, the, the government is trying very hard with these massive bailouts to, you know, multi-trillion dollar bailouts to hold everything in place, hold it all together. But somehow if it just slips out of their fingers and you, you, you start to just see, you know, l- ripple effects of distress of people becoming insolvent, you know, uh, credit worthiness, just sort of sequential ripples, you could really see a great unraveling. And so, you know, that th- that would be kind of on the extreme end. And if that happens, we'd be looking at a whole new world order in which I think the U.S. would probably be compelled to pull back from many, if not just about all of its overseas commitments. You know, you could really see a a change in the world order where China becomes the world's biggest economy. It already is sort of at parity with the U.S., um, but in a world in which we were wounded or or crippled and and they were still humming along, that would be, you know, that would be a huge geopolitical shift. um, And there could be very big implications from that. I kind of call that the fall of Rome scenario, um, (laughs) which might be out to the out to the end of the of the, of the L, but um, I mean, I'm not saying any of these things are going to happen. But I think they're just scenarios. And um, the, the the reason why the the markets are so volatile right now is because these are the scenarios. I mean, you've got everything mm-hmm. a, uh, a a V shaped recession to a deeper recession to a depression to you know a new a reshaping of world order. All these things are on the table. And when the scenarios are that extreme, every data point can swing the market wildly as people try to assess which of these scenarios they support. Yeah. And it's, and it's very unclear where this is, which of these three scenarios is right now. I think, you're, you know, because it's not, there's really no precedent for this. There's no, um, there's no playbook. This is not, you know, an asset bubble driven recession and in that intertwined global economy. It, it is very unclear kind of which, which of these scenarios is, is going to happen. Obviously, from a kind of investing and, and technology perspective, it seems it's, it's almost, it's very surprising that, you know, I think there are many sectors sort of principally education, healthcare, which have been, um, you know, almost like VC kind of shortcut is sort of avoiding education, avoiding healthcare because there's really a lack of, uh, successful, large number of successful startups in those, in those areas. Yet yeah, it does feel that maybe now is the time for education and healthcare companies that perhaps can get over the friction of regulation and kind of societal inertia. That, that now is a time for building quite interesting healthcare and education companies. Curious as you've, uh, you know, clearly we're a bit early on to be sort of enthusiastic about kind of how this changes and how we use technology to change society. But is there anything that you're seeing or sort of obviously remote work is just a, an emerging trend that will be accelerated? Yeah. There's a whole bunch of trends that were already underway that are just going to be turbocharged by this. Obviously, the shift to re- remote work, um, you know, e-commerce, uh, I mean, death of retail and the shift to e-commerce, that is just, I mean, that's going to happen 10 years faster now. I mean, it was already happening, but hard to see, you know, 80%, it seems like 80% of retailers are going to go out of business now. Everything that can be delivered will be delivered, basically. I mean, that was already happening. The shift from uh, restaurants to, to delivery as well. And, and you know, we were a Series A investor in 
cloud kitchens. Uh, the whole idea of ghost kitchens, you know, once once the main consumption of restaurant food is delivery, then it changes the whole the whole footprint that a restaurant needs. Um, so that's that's happening. Um, you have the shift from you know movie theaters to streaming. You know, I saw that Netflix and Disney now have roughly the same market cap, which is just unbelievable. It's extraordinary. So there's a lot of these trends that are already happening, and I think now they're just going to be accelerated. And then there'll be you know hopefully like you're saying in the areas of healthcare and education, we get a flashing of red tape so that, I mean, this is where I think the wartime mentality is very helpful is that we can finally cut through a lot of this red tape, um, you know, telemedicine, but, you know, letting doctors practice across state lines, you know, would help telemedicine. And so there's a lot of things like this that, um, you know, we're, we still need the government to react in the right way, but I think there could be a, an opening up um, of these markets based on, based on wartime realities. Yeah, it's so true. It's the new reality that we're in. Well, David, it was terrific to have you on today. Thank you so much for your time. Stay healthy, stay safe in this kind of crazy world we're in. So thanks again for joining me today. 